I'm joined now by Michael Klein, an analyst focusing on issues in Africa. And I want to get your reaction to this report by Amnesty International because it is getting a, a bit of press, isn't it? Yeah, it's thankfully um, drawing attention back to Darfur and Sudan, uh, something that was a one of the first rallying cries of the Internet age, really drew public attention uh, to the Save Darfur campaign, led the International Criminal Court to its first indictment of a sitting head of state and one of the world's largest peacekeeping missions. But flash forward about uh, 13 years, public attention has been uh, diverted. Um, in some ways, uh, the ICC, International Criminal Court, hasn't been able to bring Bashir in, and even the peacekeeping mission is being drawn down to pick up other conflicts in the world. What about monitoring this region? Is it difficult to do, do so? I mean, uh, talk to us a little bit about it. This is a very remote region in central Darfur, um, and the amnesty report was done remotely because uh, they, they do not have access themselves to it for a few reasons. Uh, number one, it's very insecure. There are aerial bombardments. It's very remote, no infrastructure, and the government restricts access to a very few amount of people. So they're going to need to get both investigators in there um, to ascertain whether this, uh, these allegations are really true uh, with the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, as well as reintroduce uh, UN peacekeepers if uh, there's going to be progress. You mentioned attention span. It seems like we all, our attention span shifts. Uh, of course, the Syria crisis has really dominated the news, the migrant crisis, and, and this has kind of been left out. Is there enough being done uh, on the international stage, and what more can be done when it comes to Darfur? Well, that's right. I, I hate to think that public consciousness is a zero-sum game, but I think there is some reckoning there between ongoing conflicts in Sudan and other places in Africa, Syria, Yemen, other parts of the world, uh, that have seen a proliferation in the, over the past decade. Just like the Save Darfur campaign 13 years ago was rooted in uh, public awareness, I think it's going to take that again to mobilize um, the international community, uh, drive some AU member or African nations to pursue uh, Bashir, which saw public opinion turning in that direction somewhat in South Africa after they let him get away and also to um, uh, uh, push the UN Security Council conversation, which actually just took place today, where Sudan is trying to boast that the Darfur conflict is, out, is under control um, with some iterant ceasefires that really don't mean much on the ground, and that therefore they deserve to draw down uh, peacekeeping troops and take over security themselves. You brought it up, Bashir, a sitting president, uh, two arrest warrants out for him, and yet nothing's happened. Uh, what are your thoughts on that and why? It shows the rather impotence of the International Criminal Court in a region where, uh, for maybe some obvious reasons, a lot of states have not signed on to the uh, Rome Convention that uh, implements its indictments. Um, there is some um, optimism that even though he got away in South Africa, um, a South African group successfully sued the government um, to uh, decry that ex post facto as an illegal, that they did not arrest him. Um, but it's going to take more buy-in from African states if he's ever going to be brought to justice in Europe. Yeah, I heard the word optimism thrown out there. Are, are you optimistic about the future for Darfur? Or, or what are your thoughts? I mean, we've seen this language for so long. What needs to happen? I think if we remember that just because we turn away from something, just because there's not video on uh, the television um, or the news, that something doesn't stop happening. And that's what's needed. Well, Michael, thanks so much for coming in and talking to us. Certainly appreciate it. Thanks for bringing attention to the issue. 2016. But was this a good year for democracy, especially considering we had the ongoing situation in the DRC and Gambia, where the strongmen Joseph Kabila and Yahya Jame are still clinging on to power there? That's right. Well, in a continent with 55 countries, there's always something to talk about when it comes to elections, particularly at year's end. And it's a continent with a really uh, diverse and deeply engaged electorate, which remains, when given the opportunity, the most powerful driver for change in the world. The problem is that they're often at odds with more autocratic rulers who are looking to stay in power uh, and exasperate political tensions and propagate really the misnomer that elections are about instability and that every election in Africa is a winner-take-all, do-or-die uh, bad one. Really, they should be about the competition and exchange of uh, free ideas. Um, in, despite all this diversity, 
things usually fall along two trajectories. One, you can usually guess the outcome by saying the incumbent party or leader won because they've stifled competition and consolidated power. But on the other hand, you have some countries where incum uh, incumbents have lost or stepped down from their elections and aging leaders are uh, stepping down with uh, more marginal frequency. The Gambia is an interesting uh, example at the end of the year because it really represents the intersection of these two trajectories. You had an increasingly ruthless, autocratic, strongman uh, ruler who initially uh, stepped down after making the rarity uh, of rarities in Africa, and that's the concessionary phone call to his opponent, until, of course, he took it back and said that he wouldn't be stepping down. So as we wrap up 2016 and look forward, Gambia really hangs in the balance of these two trajectories. And as we set the stage for what 2017 is going to look like, it's unclear what path um, it will uh, choose, whether it will go down uh, like more freer regional uh, countries like Senegal and Ghana, mm -hmm. or whether it will fall down the chasm of political conflict like Cote d'Ivoire did about six years ago. Let's talk about Ghana, Michael, since you mentioned it. It's long been an example of democracy and economic stability uh, in Africa with the gold, cocoa and oil, but recently falling on hard times and has sought an IMF bailout. What's happened here? Right, Ghana represents um, the other side uh, in terms of a more stable middle-income country, but also the other side of that trajectory in that uh, an incumbent uh, president who has conceded to his challenger. It's a more positive uh, note to end politically on despite its economic uncertainty and slump. But it's not the only positive outcome of 2016. Uh, there were elections at the very beginning of the year in Central African Republic, which ushered in a more peaceful uh, government and tampered down sectarian violence there. And some of the underreported elections were not presidential at all, in fact, but were uh, constitutional referendums in Senegal democratizing that political system or local elections in South Africa. Yeah, let's talk about South Africa. Jacob Zuma survives this impeachment. He says he's done nothing wrong. Uh, what's the best hope there for the economy and this chaotic government? Right, South Africa still sees itself as the leader of uh, the region. And despite uh, economic uh, slump and uh, political uh, chaos, if you will, its civil society and institutions have still been able to stand up to an increasingly uh, autocratic or uh, chaotic government. And that really, we saw that in August when local elections uh, saw the ANC, African National Congress, lose most of the major cities in South Africa to a series of opposition coalitions, which are now positioning themselves to show up the ANC in general elections down the line, which could see Africa's most iconic liberation movement uh, be voted out of power. But people but there are clearly the, still unhappy with him, Michael. Yes, and that's why we're looking closely to 2019 when they'll be holding their next general election and why that despite its economic or political and economic uncertainty, South Africa still has some of the strongest civil society that's able to stand up to increasingly autocratic or incompetent governments and why this political uh, trend for 2016 is really, in my opinion, a net positive uh, putting it on that trajectory towards a more free society despite economic and market uncertainty. People had really uh, great hope for Mohamedou uh, Buhari in Nigeria, really uh, cracking down on corruption there. But people are still um, really in poverty and, and things are not good. What is it going to take to move it around? Nigeria has had to weather a number of crises, first, be it uh, economically. Um, it's really on the losing end of the commodity slump in the past several years, particularly in oil, which accounts for the lion's share of the Nigerian economy and currency reserves. Moreover, it's battling several violent crises, uh, most famously in the north, where Boko Haram is on a sturdy back foot. In the central region, there's actually increasing sectarian violence. And in the southern oil-producing region, there's a new militancy that's resurfaced in the form of the Niger Delta Avengers, which have slashed oil production and really cut the Nigerian government's hopes of paying off or paying for solutions to uh, its economic, uh, military, and violent crises.
And that leaves it with little hope maybe except to negotiate a solution, a development-based longer-term solution with the likes of the Niger Delta Avengers, which may actually be the best hope for moving forward. Well, Michael Klein from Drum Cusack, thank you so much Michael, for your time. Michael, you mentioned Somalia, and these are the words that were used to describe it for decades. Famine, civil war, Black Hawk Down, failed state, al-Shabaab. So what does this mean for this country that has been defined by so many negative words for decades to pull off a summit like this? Yeah, I think images of war-torn Somalia are slightly outdated. If you were to see daily life in Mogadishu, the capital today, you would see bustling markets and bounding construction uh, funded in part by returning diaspora, partially by foreign countries. Um, we'll have to speak about both threats and promises, but I think on balance, the EGAD summit today, followed by uh, elections uh, later this month and in October, uh, should sound an optimistic note for Somalia and its people. Well, kind of riffing off of that, uh, the foreign affairs minister noted in this quote, uh, this is the first time Somalia hosts such a high-level summit in 30 years. We see it as a historic signal and message to the world that Somalia is coming back. Is it really coming back, or is it still fragile? Well, it's certainly a pivotal and historic moment for Somalia, but not to dispense with the optimism too quickly, but it faces a number of uh, serious threats, uh, particularly outside the capital, um, and chief among them is security. That's the reason, for instance, that today's summit was only held in the green zone uh, near Mogadishu's airport, because, and there were still reports of uh, gunfire in other parts of the capital. The chief threat comes from al-Shabaab, uh, which technically retreated from Mogadishu back in 2011, but simply shifted from uh, conventional warfare tactics to guerrilla warfare targeting the African Union, which went from being peacekeepers in Somalia to targets themselves to symbols of daily life. Well, how does the country turn the corner? Well, there's um, a number of challenges that Somalia faces. I'd say uh, there are three chief among them. Uh, firstly, security, we talked about they're going to have to bring security not just to the capital, but nationwide uh, to defeat al-Shabaab and strengthen a Somali national military to eventually take over that responsibility from the African Union. Second is politically. Um, these elections are not the finish line. They're just a hurdle in Somalia's political development. They have to see if they can bring former warlords um, and tribal leaders into the political process. There has to be respect for um, a civilian government. For instance, will President Hassan step down if he loses the election? Um, and uh, those will have to go peacefully. Now, they're not being held nationwide. There's only about 14,000 designated voters because that would be too dangerous otherwise. And uh, lastly, economic. Uh, rebuilding Somalia is going to take a lot of investment and patience. Some of that will come from returning diaspora. Others will come from foreign countries looking to cash in on that peace dividend now that security improves um, in uh, the heart of the country. Turkey has become a very important economic partner looking to cash in on that dividend in ways that China um, is looking for its returns in formerly war-torn countries such as DRC and Sudan proper. Michael Klein with Analysis Force. Thanks so much. You're welcome, Mike. To talk more about the trip as well as China-African ties, we're joined by Michael Klein. He's an Africa analyst and information director at Venture Risk Management. Uh, Mike, thanks for joining us. Yet again, Wang Yi is Pleasure. making Africa his first trip abroad of the new year. What does this signify? Right. The foreign minister's uh, annual, first annual trip is usually to a developing nation or partner country. And in the past two years, it's been to Africa, where, uh, which has become a more crucial component of the Chinese economy. It first began at the beginning of this century, when China was eating up resources beyond its borders and turned to Africa, as superpowers have before, to expand its uh, resource input. And then th after the resource slump or commodity slump that we've seen now, uh, increasingly to Africa as a market, both for cons both for Chinese-made consumer goods and also for the construction of major infrastructure projects, which are helping relieve the Chinese economy of some of this extra uh, construction capacity. You notice that Foreign Minister Wang speaks uh, really to underscore the mutual benefit of this relationship, because while the benefits in the short term 
is clear, and it's clearly crucial to the Chinese economy. Uh, there's more controversy about uh, whether uh, the relationship benefits the African public by and large uh, through increasingly uh, major uh, infrastructure projects such as the One Road, One Belt strategy. How exactly does Africa fit into this major massive initiative, the Belt and Road Initiative? How important of a part can Africa play in it? Right, the Belt and Road Initiative is really follows the model of uh, China's investment in developing countries in recent years, focusing on infrastructure, major infrastructure uh, projects in the realms of transport and energy, um, but really strings them together in a major, uh, broader scheme that envisions a global, more China-centric economy, where all roads, rails, and trading routes, if you will, lead to Beijing. All right, Michael Klein, thanks for your input from New York. For more on the rather complicated situation in South Sudan, we're joined by Michael Klein. He's an international security expert who focuses on Africa. Uh, Michael, before I get to the arms embargo, I want to talk about these brutal attacks we've seen against UN diplomats, peacekeepers, international aid workers. What is going on in South Sudan? Why so much hostility against outsiders? South Sudan, a country that's known almost nothing but war for its existence both since and before independence, has to be one of the most difficult and challenging places in the world for peacekeepers to operate. Um, people there know, like I said, little, but being in a state of conflict, there's no infrastructure. And lately, uh, peacekeepers and foreigners have become a uh, target um, themselves. This has been happening increasingly since over the summer when the last iterant ceasefire fell apart, particularly the capital Juba fell into disarray. Since then, uh, they've become targets themselves as well as the foreign aid community. And that spells a very troubling uh, situation for a country in such disarray as South Sudan. And how much does that disarray, the strife that we're seeing in South Sudan, how much is that translating into this this these attacks that we're seeing against foreigners yeah we've seen everything from uh foreigners and peacekeepers being targets of violence themselves to being denied medical care and it is i believe a, a, an elite strategy coming from uh, the top of the Sudanese, South Sudanese political structure, which has uh, commandeered this uh, perpetual conflict into an elite struggle between two factions, that of the president, Salva Kiir, and his nemesis, uh, a man by the name of Rik Machar. While Rik Machar is out of the country and Kiir is trying to consolidate power, he has found some utility in scapegoating and uh, stimming uh, further peacekeeping or UN efforts. And what about thousands of displaced civilians? What is life like for them? It's millions, really, because it's, and it's been going on for uh, decades, not just since 2013. Uh, they are living both within South Sudan in dire conditions and in refugee camps in Uganda that are saturated to levels that we're used to really only seeing in the Middle East. Uh, you have an economy that is in complete collapse. Ninety percent of the government revenue comes from oil. Well, with the drop in oil price uh, earlier this year and the force majeure of oil companies in South Sudan, that's been completely depleted, depleted the country of foreign reserves uh, with inflation skyrocketing to over 700 percent. Currency is virtually worthless, commodities, even food, unaffordable. And the South Sudanese population uh, really sees themselves again as a pawn among this uh, conflict of the elites of their uh, young uh, country. Young country indeed, but so many problems. Michael Klein, thank you so much for being here. Pleasure. Welcome back. Let's now bring in Michael Klein. He is an Africa risk consultancy specialist. Michael, thanks for being with us. Michael, how did this happen? How do you have children giving vaccines? This, this is horrible news, as happens to often be the case coming out of the South Sudan, Sudan region, right. a country born out of war, into war, only about seven years ago. And this really encompasses all of the overlapping crises that are pressuring down on South Sudan. From underdevelopment, we hear that one of the reasons why the vaccines were so toxic was because they were not refrigerated, right. probably because there's no electricity to refrigerate them. To human rights, children were forced to administer the vaccines themselves. 
to the humanitarian crisis, not just disease from measles to cholera making their comeback among a population that has very low vaccination rates, but a famine that's stretching the right. arc from northern Nigeria, where you were just discussing earlier, to South Sudan, to Somalia. And finally, the war that's ravaged the country since 2013, and before that was the longest running civil war in Africa's history between South Sudan and Sudan. Well, you mentioned so much right there about what is so troubling about the South Sudan. And region. I mean, beyond the war and, of course, the measles outbreak that they were dealing with this time, they've been hit with cholera and famine. What is being done? What can be done? It's easy to often oversimplify conflicts, particularly in Africa, where we're used to the tinderbox of African uh, conflicts and strong men and despots um, between lines of tribalism or ethnicism. Uh, but here, there's another word that I think we have to usually think about, and that's elitism. And it might sound funny for such a poor, desolate country as South Sudan, but what it really means is that the people at the top of the country calling the shots right. are the people right. who are, have, 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 have brooded this uh, conflict between themselves. And the South Sudanese people, of course, want peace uh, as much or more than anyone. A very disconcerting situation. Uh, we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you so much, Michael Klein. Thanks for Klein. bringing attention to this. Well, thank you for joining Michael, us, Michael welcome. Klein. Hi, Hosea. Thank you. First, I want to get your reaction to Somalia being on the list of those tra uh, seven countries facing that temporary travel ban. Yeah, I don't think it... I don't think it's surprising necessarily, given that uh, the seven countries represent uh, states that are either state sponsors of terrorism or uh, essentially failed states. Somalia really represents a nexus of an al-Qaeda-linked terrorist organization and even ISIS-linked organizations and what has been a non-functioning government for basically the past 22 years. Unfortunately, there is a very uh, significant Somali diaspora in the United States that's being separated and torn apart from their families. But among the seven countries, um, I don't see, uh, even with this, uh, even with the optimism on the ground in Mogadishu and in Africa circles, um, I don't see the ban, uh, it necessarily affecting the ban anytime soon, as long as it's underway. Uh, what else can we expect as far as relations with Somalia go under President Trump? Right. Well, this uh, uh, unexpected result of Formaggio winning uh, really was a boon in that he was seen as the least corrupt as the final contenders in an election that just was staggering in terms of how open corruption was with thousands, even millions of dollars changing hands for votes. Formaggio was actually not the candidate who was passing out the most money. That was the incumbent who had access to state coffers. Um, and he won anyway. So it shows just that maybe the highest bidder doesn't always win um, in this type of election. And it's interesting uh, to see how military intervention will continue to roll out. Military intervention in Somalia has been very small scale and really represented the Obama administration's strategy in uh, intelligence-based surgical strikes that were seen to both further U.S. interests and build foreign capacity. I think when we look at uh, what the Trump administration policy will be in this area, you have to look um, a bit farther down the line as to what appointments will uh, be made in the specialized assistant secretary roles. Let's talk a little bit more about the security situation in Somalia. There are ongoing attacks by al-Shabaab. We talked about the U.S. military involvement there. Do you think it has made a difference in uh, lessening the threat, if you will? The election was voted by um, only 100 or, or so uh, members of parliament, and that's because after originally backing a one-person, one-vote system, even the United States and Western powers realized that that just simply wasn't tenable given the security situation. It's very difficult to securitize Mogadishu. Even the airport where the election was held was in a hangar because al-Shabaab uh, launched some mortar attacks there the day before. And then once you spread outside of uh, Mogadishu, the federal government just controls slices, then you get north into Puntland and Somaliland, um, where you have a different set of organizations linked to ISIS.
uh, who are propagating terrorist uh, threats there, including this week. So unfortunately, although there is some cause for optimism on the political front, and uh, as you can see in the footage in Mogadishu, you know, street scenes in Mogadishu are a lot different than the war-torn images we have of Somali during the 90s. But reaching beyond uh, that capital right. and securitizing the rest of the country will be a serious problem for this government. Michael Klein. Michael Klein, he's an analyst focusing on issues in Africa. Uh, Gambia's uh, decision considered a big blow to the court in the sense that the chief prosecutor actually comes from Gambia. Talk to us about the significance of this move. Right, Mike. Gambia is actually the third of the latest countries to withdraw or signal their withdrawing from the International Criminal Court in Africa, a continent that has the most conflicts in the world and arguably the least capable and impartial judicial space. That's an intersection that the court was intended to address in the first place. The larger or longer term problem is this, this in fact, signals an exodus. Um, in this troubled region because the court can only operate within its member states. So it shrinks not only its stature, uh, but also its jurisdiction. So are we going to see an exodus? Because Kenya and Namibia are also uh, talking about taking similar steps. As well as uh, Uganda. And uh, Kenya, Uganda, and uh, Burundi and Gambia are countries that have their own legal shortcomings and allegations of high level political crimes that the court was supposed to address. The real problem is South Africa, which has more developed democratic institutions signaling they're going to withdraw, possibly providing cover for African neighbors uh, as they make a play to be a leader in the region. Uh, the Gambian government statement said that the court unfairly targeted African leaders. The court is supposed to target leaders. We would think it were unfair if it were only targeting uh, low-level officials. It's not supposed to primarily target Africans. And that's a problem that has been rumbling on the continent and that the court uh, had foreseen uh, for some time. Michael Klein is a senior analyst for Drum Cusack, the firm specializing in risk assessment. How much is fact and how much is fiction? Suicide bombings have increased in the past month because Boko Haram is shifting to more traditional terrorist tactics as they've been routed out of the territory that they held by the counterinsurgency. As they do that, they uh, shift towards suicide bombings and ambushes. It's true that a lot of these suicide bombings are reported to be young girls. That's been a really troubling legacy of the Chibok, um kidnapping. Is this a case where Boko Haram is that strong? or Nigeria is just that weak? I think the key word here is strategy. Boko Haram has a strategy. It's been portrayed as a ragtag group of gunmen, but they are very adaptable. The question is, does the government have a strategy? The colossus of the Nigerian government, not adaptable. They haven't been able to adapt their conventional warfare approach to the asymmetric and uh, terroristic suicide bombings and attacks that Boko Haram can uh, uh, use as it shifts into the state. It's a sign that maybe they have not been as decimated as people thought. There are three at least real reasons why we see the sudden escalation. One is that there's a new president in town and they want to hit him hard before he can stand up. Two, they've adapted their strategy um, to the conventional counterinsurgency um, techniques of uh, the government to uh, retreat from holding territory towards more asymmetric warfare that relies on sleeper terrorist cells, more in the, more, the model of Al-Qaeda. The third uh, reason is that we're in the middle of the holy month of Ramadan, and that is actually an ISIL process. Okay, so what are the implications of his win on Nigeria's two militant movements, Boko Haram in the north, and the Niger Delta media uh, militancy in the South. Right, so the, Nigeria basically has two historic militant movements. One everyone knows about right now is Boko Haram, that's which is raging in the northeast of the country, um, the region uh, where Bahari himself is from. And there's also a latent Niger Delta militancy, which people might remember more from the early 2000s. A lot of the disbanded militant groups uh, in the south had threatened to take to the streets or produce more unrest or violence um, in protest of Bahari's candidacy. But I think ultimately we believe that the leaders of the those militant groups will be waiting to see what concessions they can get from a new Bihari administration um, before making more attacks. After all, the president that originally took the brought the Niger Delta militancy under control was the former president Yardwa, who was a Muslim from the same northern region as Bihari. Defeat and an incumbent. So, what does that say about Nigeria's population, its voters, and and how their views may have changed dramatically? And, and how has he been able to shed his past as a military ruler? It's 
a major sign of Nigeria's uh, maturity as a democracy, um, how far it's come just from 1997 when multi-party elections began. Like I said, I think the greatest impact that Buhari has had so far was his election. It's pro it, his election did more to instill confidence and unite the country than probably anything in the past 18 years. Uh, Nigeria is an extraordinarily young country. 70% of its population is under the age of 30. So uh, starting or getting off on the right foot now in 2015 could mean a lot for its own political development. The influence um, is going to stay the same. In fact, it's spreading just from the economic model that I was just alluding to, to political, uh, where China is getting involved in building political capacity with African nations to security and, and being involved in peacekeeping operations. Um, but it is, go and, and in those instances, actually, you see somewhat that it's a two-way um, uh, influence, although it's heavily weighted on one end. Uh, you see China, uh, you know, delving into um, certain doctrines that it would never explore um, internally or in the Asian sphere. As we see certain African countries who have grown commodity dependent on their relationship with China really crash economically. But there's still a lot of um, room to uh, be made in terms of major infrastructure development projects like this in, uh, information superhighway. And that still has um, some very positive influence potential um, with driving wages and uh, capacity and kind of higher value investment up in Africa itself. Michael Klein joining us from On the New topic York City of terror, Country. given the continued threat of terrorist activity in Europe and in light of the recent terror attacks in the UK, in this week's Industry Insights segment, we opted to talk about security. Africa is one of the world's most complex regions, yet when people tend to oversimplify, safe travel there requires nuanced understanding of divergent threats which can be rudimentarily divided into three broad categories. First, conflict. Though interstate conflicts at an all-time low, several countries have earned their reputations as tinderboxes of violence and unrest. Elections are important milestones, such as in Kenya this August, but the worst conflict now is in South Sudan, where aid workers have been targeted by belligerents. Secondly, while terrorism is no stranger in the West, it takes on a more virulent tone in Africa, where weak state security can embolden and exacerbate attacks. Finally, crime. In some countries, poor conditions have bred environments where it's a facet of society. Yet again, it varies. Kidnappings dominate Nigeria, while carjackings reign in Kenya, both targeting vulnerable partners rather than eschewing them. So it's important to connect with established providers and know the local environments when traveling in Africa where the range of threats can be as diverse as the continent.